What can a heroine do? Or why women can't write? One, two strong women battle for supremacy in the early West. Two, a young girl in Minnesota finds her, finds her womanhood by killing a bear. Three, an English noblewoman vacationing in, in Arcadia falls in love with a beautiful, modest young shepherd. But duty calls, she must return to the court of Elizabeth I to wage war on Spain. Just in time, the shepherd lad is revealed to be the long lost son of the queen. Of a neighboring country. The lovers are united and our her heroine carries of her husband to be lad in waiting to be king of England. A phosphorescentifor, a phosphorescently doomed poetess, sponges off her husband and drinks herself to death, thus alienating the community of Philistines and businesswoman women who would have continued to give her lecture dates. Five. A handsome young man, quite virginal, he is seduced by an older woman who has made a pact with the devil, devil to give her back her youth. When the woman becomes pregnant, she proudly announces the paternity of her child. This revelation so shames the young man that he quite goes quite insane, steals into the house where a baby is kept, murders it, and he is taken to prison where, repentant and surrounded by angel voices, he dies. Six. Alexandra the Great. 7. A young man who unwisely puts success, success in business before his personal fulfillment loses his masculinity and ends up as a neurotic, lonely, lonely eunuch. 8. A beautiful, seductive boy whose narcissism and instinctive cunning hide the fact that he has no mind, and in fact, hardly any sentient consciousness, drives a succession of successful actresses, movie producers, product dresses, cowgirls, and film directresses wild with desire. They rape him. Authors do not make their plots up of the thin air, nor are they about pure inventions. Every one of them is a story familiar to us. What makes them look so odd and so funny is that in each case the sex of the protagonist has been changed, and correspondingly the sex of the other characters. The result is that these very familiar plots simply will not work. They are tales for heroes, not heroines, and one of the things that, that handicaps women writers in our and every other culture is that there are so few stories in which women can figure as protagonists. Culture is male. This does not mean that every man in Western or Eastern society can do exactly as he pleases, or that, or that every man creates the culture solus, or that every man is luckier or more privileged than every woman. What it does mean, among other things, is that the society we live in is a patriarchy, and patriarchies imagine or picture themselves from the male point of view. But it is an underground, unofficial, minor culture. Um, there is a female culture, but there, it is an underground, unofficial, minor culture, occupying a small corner of what we think of officially as possible human experience. Both men and women in our culture can see the culture from a single point of view, the male. Now, uh, writers, as I have said, do not make up their stories out of the whole cloth. They are pretty much restricted to the attitudes, the beliefs, the expectations, and above all, the plots that are in the air. Plot being what Aristotle called mythos. And in fact, it is probably most accurate to call these plot patterns myths. They are dramatic embodiments of what a culture believes to be true. And what it would be like, like to be true, or what it is mortally afraid may be true. Novels, especially, depend upon central action. Depend upon what central action can be imagined as being performed by the protagonist or protagonists. Um, that's to say, what can a central character do in a book? An examination of English literature or Western literature reveals that all the possible actions people can do in this fiction. In this fiction, very few can be done by women. Our literature is not about women. It is not about women and men equally. It is by and about men. But, you might object, aren't our books and our movies full of women? Isn't there a love interest, or at least a sexual interest, in every movie? What about Cleopatra? What about Juliet? 
Well, Juliet. What about Sophia Western, Clarissa Harlow, Faye Greener, Greta Garbo, Pips Stella, and the succession of love goddesses without whom film history would hardly exist? Our literature is full of women. Bad women, good women, mother women, witty women, faithful women, promiscuous women, beautiful women, plain women, women who have no relations with men. Or so many, ma so many male characters in American literature have no relations with women. Uh, only enough, no. If you look at the plot summarized at the beginning of the article and turn them back to their original forms, you will find not women but images of women. Maiden, modest maidens, wicked trend trusses, pretty school moms, beautiful bitches, faithful wives, and so on. They exist only in relation to a protagonist who is male. Moreover, look at them carefully and you will see that they do not really exist at all. At their best, they are depictions of the social roles women are supposed to play, and often do play, but they are the public roles and not the private women. At their worst, they are gorgeous, clad, cook hole and fantasies about what men want, or hate, or fear. How can women writers possibly use such myths? In 20th century American literature, there is a particularly fine example of these impossible women, a figure who is beautiful, irresistible, wrathless, ruthless, but fascinating. Fascinating because she's somehow cheap or contemptible, who, in her more passive form, destroys men by her indifference, and who, when the male author is more afraid of her, destroys men's act men actively, sometimes by shooting them. She's she Harlow, Daisy Faye, Faye Greener, Mrs. Markunde, and Deborah Royak Rojak. She's the bitch goddess. Now, it is just as useless to us where the bitch goddess is so bitchy as it is to us where the noble savage is so noble. Neither person really exists. In existential terms, they are both the other. The other does not have the kind of inner life or consciousness that you or and I have. In fact, the other has no mind at all. No man in his senses ever says to himself, to himself, I acted nobly because I am a noble savage. His reasons are far more prosaic. I did what I did because I was afraid, or because I was ambitious, or because I wanted to provoke my father, or because I felt lonely, or because I needed money, and so on. Look for reasons like that to explain the conduct of the bitch goddess, and you will not find them. There is no explanation in terms of human motivation, or the woman's inner, own inner life. She simply behaves the way she does because she's a bitch. QED, no other uh, ever has the motives that you and I have. The other contains a mysterious essence which causes it to behave as it does. In fact, it is not a person at all, but the projective wish of fear. The bitch goddess is not a person. Virgin victim Gretchen, see number five above, is not a person. The, the faithful wife, the beautiful temptress, the, the, the seductive destroyer, the devouring mama, the healing Madonna, none of these are persons in the sense that a novel's protagonist must be a person. None of is of the slightest use as a myth to the woman writer who wishes to write about a female protagonist. Try, for example, to change, to change the bitch goddess male victim story into a woman's story. Are we to simply change the sex of the characters and write about a male bitch and a female victim? The myth still works in the male homosexual terms man and cruel youth, but the female equivalent is something quite different. Changing the sex of the protagonist completely alters the meaning of the tale. The story of woman cruel lover is the story of so many English ballads. You have the full strudel of a and the pregnant girl left either to mourn or to die, but you do not have to indicate only some elements of the story. The cruel lover as the materially sumptuous but spiritually bankrupt spirit of our civilization, the essence of sex, the soul of our corrupt culture, a dramatization of the split between the degrading necessities of the flesh and the transcendence of world cleaving will. What you have instead is the story, if the story is told about or by the woman, it is a cautionary tale warning you not to break social rules. In short, a much more realistic story of social error or transgression leading to ostracism, poverty, or death. Moral, get married first. No career woman or a literature keeps in the back of her mind the glamorous figure of Daisy Faye, 
beautiful rich and different boy she loved back in Cleveland when she was fighting for a career as a bootlegger. Reversing sexual roles in fiction may make good burlesque or good fantasy, but it is ludicrous in terms of serious literature. Culture is male. Our literary myths are for heroes, not heroines. What can a heroine do? What myths, what plots, what actions are available to a female protagonist? Very few. For example, it is impossible to write a conventional success story with a heroine. For heroine, for success in success in male terms is failure for a woman. A fact: movies, books, and television plays have been endlessly proven to us for decades. Nor, did it, nor it is, is the hard drinking, hard fighting hero imagined as female, except as an amusing flu fluke. For example, Bob Hope and Jane Russell in The Pale Face. Nor can our heroine be the romantic poet glamorously doomed, nor be oversensitive artist who cannot fulfill his worldly, worldly responsibilities. Emily Dickinson seems to fit the later pattern pretty well, but she's always treated as the spinster, an exclusively female and sexual role. Nor can the heroine be the intellectual born into a Philistine small town who escapes to a big city. A female intellectual cannot escape her problems by fleeing to a big city. She's still a woman. A woman, as intellectual, is not one of our success needs. Myths. One, uh, with one or two exceptions, which I will deal with later, all subliterary genres are close to the heroine. She cannot be a Mickey explain private eye, for example, nor can she be one of H. Ryder's Haggard's adventure story in which man who discovers the lost princess in some imaginary corner of Africa. She can be the lost princess, but a story written with the princess herself as protagonist would resemble the chronicle of any other monarch and will hardly fit the female figure of Haggard's romances, who is again the other. The hero whose success is business in business alienates him from his family is not at all in the position of the heroine who loses her femininity by, co by comparing with men. He is not the sexy, but she is. The crass business man genre, minor anyway, is predicated on the assumption that success is masculine and a good thing as long as you don't spend all your time at it. One needs to spend the small part of one's life recognizing the claims of personal relations and relaxation. For the heroine, the conflict between success and sexuality is itself of the issue, and the duality is absolute. The woman who becomes hard and unfeminine, who competes with men, finally becomes, have we seen this video before? A bitch. Again. Women in 20th century American literature seem pretty much limited to either, to either devourer slash bitches or maiden slash victims. Perhaps male authors have bad consciences. Perhaps male authors have bad consciences. So we come at last to the question of utmost importance to novelists. What will my protagonists do? What central action can be the core of the novel? I know of only one plot or myth that is genderless and in which heroines can figure equally with heroes. This is the abused child story. I mean, of the Dickensian part. And indeed, many heroines do be in a life of sensitive, mistreated waves. But such a pattern can be used only while the heroine is still a child, as in the first part of Jane Eyre. Patient Richard Zelda, who also suffered and endured, was not a mistreated child, but the other heroine of a particular kind of love story. And here, of course, we come to the wonderful view of patient of a female protagonist in literature, the one thing she can do. And by God, she does it, and does it, and does it, over and over again. She's the protagonist of a love story. She turned down. The tone may range from grave to gay, from the tragedy of Anna Karenina to the comedy of Emma, but the myth is always the same. Innumerable variants of falling in love, on courtship, on marriage, on the failure of courtship and marriage, how she got married, how she did not get married, all was tragic, how she fell in love and committed all the adultery, how she saved her marriage but just barely. How she loved a vile seducer and loathed. How she loved a vile seducer and loathed and died in childbirth. As far as literature is concerned, heroines are still restricted to one vice, one virtue, and one occup occupation. In novels of Doris Lesson, the author is concerned with a great many th other things besides love. 
the heroines still spend most of their energy and time maintaining relations with their lovers, or marrying, or divorce, divorcing, or failing to achieve orgasm, or achieving it, or worrying about their sexuality, their men, their loves, and their love lives. <clears throat> For female, female protagonists, the love story includes not only personal relations as such, but build on Stroman, worldly success, or worldly failure, career, disposition of character, crucial learning experience, since the transition to adulthood, rebellion, usually adultery, and everything else, only in the work of a few iconoclasts like Sean Chabena Shaw do you find protagonists like Vivian Warren, whose work means more to her than marriage, or St. Joan, who has no love life at all. It is interesting that Martha Graham's danced version of St. Joan's life turns the tale back into a love story, with St. Mike Michael at one point in the version I saw. Inspiring John by, by walking astride her from head to foot, throwing his robe over her several times as she lies on her back on the stage floor. How she lost him, how she got him, how she get him, how she died for with him, how what else is there? A new pattern seems to have been developing in the last few years. Our authoresses who do not wish to write love stories may instead write about heroines whose main action is to go mad, but... How she went crazy will also lose his charming time. One cannot write the Belshar or Jane Eyre, good as it is, forever. A woman writes on my age, if she wishes, abandon female protagonists altogether and stick to male myths with male protagonists. By so doing, she falsifies herself and much of her own experience. Part of life is obviously common to both sexes. We all eat, we all get stomach aches, and we all grow out and die. But a great deal of life is not shared by men and women. A woman who refuses to write about women ignores the whole experience of the female culture, a very different one from the official male culture. All her specifically erotic experiences and a good deal of her own history, she falsifies her position both artistically and humanly. She is an artist creating a world in which persons of her kind cannot be artists, a consciousness central to itself creating a world in which women have no consciousness. A successful person creating a world in which persons like herself cannot be successes. She's a self trying to pretend that she's a different self, one for whom her own self is the other. If a female writer does not use the two, possibly three myths available to a she writer, she must drop the culture's myths altogether. It isn't in itself a bad thing. Perhaps what we need here is a digression on the artistic advantages of, work, of working with myths. Um, that's to say, Material that has passed through other hands, that is, that is no raw brand new. The insistence that author may, authors make up their own plots is a recent development in literature. Milton certainly did not. Even today, with novelty at such a premium in all the arts, very little is written that is not, at bottom, common property. It is commonplace that bad writers imitate and great writers steal. Even an iconoclast like Shaw stole his blood wholesale, sometimes from melodrama, sometimes from history, sometimes from his friends. <clears throat> Ibsen, all the depth described, Dickens to theater melodrama, James to other fiction of his own time, nothing flowers without history, something that has been worked on by others in the same culture, sometimes something that is in the air, provides a writer with material that has been distilled, dramatized, stylized, and above all, clarified. A develop me, a develop me, a develop it me, a develop it me, has its own form, its own structure, its own expectations and values, its own cues to nudge the reader. When so much of the basic work has already, when so much of the basic work has already been done, the reader, the artist may either give the myth its final realization or stand it on its head. But in any case, what she or he does will neither will be neither tentative nor crude, and it will not take forever. It can simply be done well. For example, the very pattern of dramatic construction that we take as natural, the idea that a story ought to have a beginning, a middle, and, a, and an end, that one ought to be led to something called a climax, by something called a suspense or dramatic tension, it, it's in itself an accidental myth. Western artists, therefore, do not have to invent this pattern for themselves. Hemingway, whom we call a realist, spent his whole working life capitalizing on the dramatic lucidity possible to an artist who works with developed myths. 
The beach goddess did not appear full blown in the short and happy life of Frances Macomber. One can find her in uh, Fitzgerald or Hawthorne, to name an earlier writer, or Max Bierbochum, whose Suleika Dobson is certainly a beach goddess, though a less serious one of her American, co American cousins. Macomber is the ultimate fictional refinement at the, uh, the mess and bother of real life. Beyond it lies only nightmare. Fake green in the west, the of the locusts, or the half master fantastications Miller uses to get a little more millage out of an almost exhaustive pattern. Macomber is perfectly clear as it's most of Hemingway's work. Nobody can fail to understand that Mrs. Macomber is a bitch, that the white hunter is a real man, and that Macomber is a fail man. The dramatic conflict is extremely clear, very vehement, and completely unexpected. The characters are simple, emotionally charged, and large, larger than life. Therefore, the fine details of the story can be polished to the point of high gloss where everything, whether gesture, laconic conversation, terrain, equipment, clothing, is all of meaning. Compare Macomber with Robinson and Crusoe, for example. Before is much less sure from moment to moment of what he wants to say or what it means. We're gonna stop to us why Mrs. Macomber is so bitchy. She's just a bitch, that's all. And why killing a large animal will restore Macomber's manhood? Everybody knows the whale. But why the bitch cannot tolerate a real man? These things are already explained out the myth. But this kind of larger than life simplicity and clarity is not accessible to a woman writer unless she remains within the limits of the love story. Again, what can do can a heroine do? There seems to me to be two alternatives open to a woman author who no longer cares about how she fell in love or how she went mad. These are one, lyricism, and two, life. By lyricism, I do not mean purple passages or bar baroque ruptures. I mean a pr particular principle of the structure. Uh, if the narrative mode of Aristotle called uh, epic concerns itself with events connected by the chronological order in which they occur, occur and the dramatic mode with voluntary human actions which are connected both by chronology and causation, Then the principle of construction I wish to call lyric consists of the organization of discrete elements, images, events, scenes, passages, words, what have you, around an unspoken thematic or emotional center. The lyric mode exists without chronology or causation. Its principle of connection is associative. Of course, no piece of writing can exist purely in one mode, but we can certainly talk of the predominance of one element, perhaps two. In this sense, of lyric, Virginia Woolf is a lyric novelist. In fact, she has been criticized in just those terms. Nothing happens in her books. A writer who employs the lyric structure is setting various images, events, scenes, or memories to cycling around an unspoken invisible center. The invisible center is what the novel or poem is about. It is also unstable in available dramatic or narrative terms. That is, there is no action possible to a central character, and no series of events that will embody in clear, unequivocal, immediate, graspa graspable terms what the artist means. Or perhaps there is no action or series of events that will embody the center at all. Unable to use the myths of male, cul male culture, and apparently unwilling to spend her, write her life writing love stories, Wolf uses a structure that is basically non-narrative, hence the lack of plot. The repetitiousness, the gathering up of the novels into moments of epiphany, the denseness of the writing, the indirection. There is nothing the female characters can do except excess, except thing, except feel. And critics, mostly most male, employ the usual vocabulary of denigration. These novels lack important events, they are hermetically sealed, they are full of sensibility, they are trivial, they lack action, they are feminine. Not every female author is equipped with the kind of command of language that allows or insists upon their construction. Nor does every woman writer want to employ this mode. The alternative is to take as one's model and structural principle, not male made, but the structure of one's own experience. So we have George Eliot or Doris Lessing's or lack of a structure, the obviously tacked on ending of meal on the floors. We have Bronte's spasmodic, jerky world of the left, 
we have a structured model on the heroines. Trump probably offers real situation. How to write a novel about a person to whom nothing happened, a person to whom nothing but a love story is supposed to happen, a person inhabiting a world in which the only reality is frustration or endurance, all this plus an unbearable mystifying confusion. The movement of the lead is not the perfect curve of the gen air, a classic version of the female love story. It is a block jabbing, a constant thwarting, it is the protagonist's constantly frustrated will to action and her alternatively losing and regaining her perception of her own situation. There are vestiges of gothic mystery and there is a love story, but the gothic mysteries turn out to be fictory and the love story, which occupies only the last quarter of the book, vanishes strangely and abruptly on the last page by one. In cases like these, the usual epithet is formless, sometimes qualified but inexperienced, Obviously, life is not like that. Life is not messy and indecisive. We know what life and novels are from Aristotle, who wrote about plays. A male novelist who employed male myths created by a culture that imagines itself from the male point of view. The task of art, we know, is to give form to life. That's to say, the very forms that women writers cannot use. So it's clear that women can't write. They, are, they swing wildly from lyricism to messiness once they abandon the cosy realms of the love story. And success is between the love story, which is in itself imagined out of genuine female experience, are not important because the love story is not important. It is a commonplace of criticism that only the male myths are valid or interesting. A book as fine and well structured as Jane Eyre fails even to be seen by many critics because it grows out of experiences, events, fantasies, wishes, fears, daydreams, images of self entirely foreign, foreign to, the, uh, to their own. As critics are usually unwilling to believe their lack of understanding to their, be their own fault, it becomes the fault of the book or the author or of all women writers. Western European and North American culture is not only male in the point of view, it is also Western European. For example, it is not Russian. 19th century Russian fiction can be criticized as much in the same terms as women's fiction. Pointless or plotless narratives stuffed with strange minutiae, minutia, it are, are, are not obeying the accepted rules of dramatic development, lyrical in the wrong places, condensed in the wrong places, and overly emotional, obsessed with things we do not understand, perhaps even grotesque. Here we have all those outsiders who are trying in less than a century to assimilate European myths, producing a strange Russian hybrid, a King Lear of the Steppe, Lady Mahagved of Mstech, trying to work with literary patterns that do not suit their experiences and were not developed with them in mind. What do we get? Only the aggressive Pushkin, formless Dostoevsky, Colin Wilson has called Dostoevsky's novels sofa pillows stuffed with blood of concrete, a sprawling glacial hole in classic Tolstoy, and of course lyrical Chekhov, whose magnificent plays are called bloodless to this very day. There is an even more vivid and tragic example. What is an American black writer to make out of accepted myths? For example, what is he or she to make of the steel current myth, so prominent in King Lear, that suffering brings wisdom? This is an old still used plot. Does suffering bring wisdom to the invisible man? When critics do not find what they expect, they cannot imagine that the fool might blind their own expectations. I know of a case in which the critics, white and female, decided after long nervous discussion that Baldwin was not really a novelist, but that Orwell was. Critical bias aside, all artists are going to be in the soup pretty soon, if they aren't already. As a culture, we are coasting on the tag ends of our assumptions about a lot of things, including the difference between fiction and propaganda. As novelists, we are working with myths that have been so repeated, so triply distilled, the style, that they are almost exhausted. Outside of commercial genres, which can remain predified and profitable infinitely, how many more incarnations of the big goddess can anyone stand? How many more shoot and ups on Main Street? How many more young men with identity problems? The lack of workable needs in literature, of acceptable dramatization of what are experience beings. 
comes much more than art itself. We do not only choose or reject works of art on the basis of these myths. We interpret our own experience in terms of them. Worse still, we actually perceive what happens to us in the myths. Mythic terms our culture provides. The problem of outsider artists is the whole problem what we do with unlabeled, disallowed, disavowed, not even consciously perceived experience. Experience which cannot be spoken about because it has no embodiment in existing art. If one is one to create new forms wholesale, which is practically impossible, or turn old ones like Blake's Elizabeth, Elizabethan lyrics and yeah, no place, or trivial tragic genres like Austen's ladies' fiction, make something unspeakable and you make it unthinkable. Hence the lyric structure, which can deal with the unspeakable and unembodiable as its thematic center, or the realistic building up of detail, which may, if you're lucky, eventually add up to the unspeakable, undramatizable, unembodiable action one cannot name. Outsiders writing is always in critical jeopardy. Insiders know perfectly well that they are owed too much their ideas of it. Thus, insiders notice instantly whether the material of Jane Eyre is trivial and the emotionally unten emotionality untenable, even though the structure is perfect. George Eliot, whose point of view is neither peccable nor ridiculously romantic, does not know what fate to award her herrings and thus falsifies her endings. Jeanette, Jeanette, whose lyrical mode of construction goes unnoticed, in meaningless and disgusting. Kafka, who can translate in his short stories only certain common myths into fantastic or extreme versions of themselves, does not have Tolstoy's wide crafts of life. That Tolstoy lacks Kafka's understanding of alienation is sometimes commented upon, but that does not count, of course. Ellison is passionate but shapeless and crude. Austin, whose sense of form cannot be impugned, impugnated, it is not passionate enough. Blake is inexplicable, Baldwin lacks Shakespeare's great gift of reconciliation, and so on and so on. But outsiders' problems are real enough, and we will all be facing them quite soon, as the nature of human experience on the planet changes radically, unless, of course, we are end up in the second Paleolithic, in which case we will have to set about recreating the myths of the first Paleolithic. Perhaps one place to look for myths that escape from the equation culture male is in those genres that already employ plots not limited to one sex, myths that have nothing to do with our accepted gender roles. There seems to me to be three places one can look. 1. Detective stories. As long as these are limited to gen genuine intellectual puzzles, crime fiction is a different genre. Women write, write this, women read this, women even figure in them as protagonists. The slang name who done it nearly neatly describes the myth, finding out who did it, whatever it is. Two, supernatural fiction, even often written by women, English women at least, during the 19th century and the first part of the 20th. These are about the intrusion of something strange, dangerous, and not natural into one's familiar world. What to do? In the face of the supernatural, knowledge and character become crucial. The accepted gender roles are often irrelevant. After all, putting, putting a 12 foot tall Batrachian with a kerosene lamp is an act that can be accomplished by either sex, and both heroes and heroines can be expected to feel sufficient or horror to make the story interesting. My example is from a short story by H.P. Lovecraft and August Derlis. Uh, however, much of this genre is as severe, severely, severely limited as the detective story. They both seem to have reached the point of decadence where writers are restricted to their reenactment of ritual gestures. Moreover, supernatural fiction often relies on very threadbare social sexual roles. For example, aristocratic Hungarian Count drinks the blood of beautiful innocent English women. Vampire stories use the myths of an old-fashioned eroticism. Other tales trade on the fear of certain animals like snakes or spiders, disgust at the mold or slime, human aggression taking the form of literal bestiality, lycanthropy, guilt without intention, the Lex Talionis, 
severe retribution for venial, venial faults, supernatural contamination, in short, retribution for venial faults, uh, in short, what the psychoanalyst will call the archaic contents of the mind. Three, science fiction, which seems to me to provide the broad pattern for human myths, even if the specifically futuristic or fantastic elements are uh, subtracted. I accept the kind of male adventure called space opera, which may be part of science fiction as a genre, but it's not innate in science fiction as a mode. <clears throat> Uh, the myth of science fiction run along the lines of exploring any world conceptually, not necessarily physically, creating needed physical or social machinery, accessing the consequences of technological and other changes, and so on. These are not stories about men who are men or we, woman, women who are women. They are myths of human intelligence and human adaptability. They are not, they are not only ignored of gender roles, but at least theoretically are not culture bound. Some of the most fascinating characters in science fiction are not human. Um, through the, through the attempts to break through culture binding, I mean only that we transform the myths like black is bad, white is good, at the heart of darkness myth, into new asininities like giants are ants are bad, people are good, at least the later can be subscribed to by all human races and sexes. Giant ants might feel differently. Dark Serving of the University of Montreal has suggested that science fiction patterns often resemble those of medieval literature. I think the resemblance lies in them that medieval literature of so often dramatizes not people's social roles but the little life of the soul. Hence we find the following pattern in both science fiction and medieval tales. One, I find myself in a new world, not knowing who I am or where I came from. I must find this out. I also find out the rules of the world I inhabit. The journey of the soul from birth to death. Two, society needs something. I, we must find it. The quest. Three, we are miserable because our way of life is out of whack. We must find out what's wrong and change it. The drama of sin and salvation. Science fiction, political fiction, parable, allegory, exemplum, all carry a heavier intellectual fright than self-consciously so, than we are used to. All are didactic, all imply that human problems are collective as well as individual, and take these problems to be spiritual, social, perceptive, or cognitive, not the fictionally sect link, link problems of success, competition, castration, education, love, or even personal identity, with which we are also very familiar. I will go even farther and say that science fiction, political fiction, when successful, and the molds, if not the content, of much medieval fiction all provide myths for dealing with the kinds of experiences we are actually having now instead of the literary myths we have inherited, which only tell us about the kinds of experiences we think we ought to be having. This might sound like the old cliché about the Soviet plot of girl meets boy, boy meets tractor. And why not? Our current fictional myths leave vast areas of human experience unexplored, work for one, gen genuine religious experience for another, and above all, the lives of and above all, the lives of the traditionally voiceless, the majority of whom are women. When I speak of the traditionally voiceless, I'm not pleading for descriptions of their lives. We have had plenty of that by very vocal writers, but I'm talking about their fiction of myths growing out of their lives and told by themselves for themselves. Forty years ago, those Americans who read books to adults read a good deal of fiction. Um, those forty years ago, those Americans who read books read a great deal of fiction. Nowadays, such persons read, read popularized anthropology, psychology, history, and philosophy. Perhaps current fictional myths no longer tell the truth about any of us. Um, when, things are when things are changing, those who know least about them, in the usual terms, may make the best job of them. There is so much, much to be written about, and here we are uh, with nothing but the rags and tatters of what used to mean something. One thing I think we must know, that our traditional gender roles will not be part of the future, as long as the future is not a second stay on age. 
Our traditions, our books, our morals, our manners, our films, our speech, our economic organization, everything we have inherited tell us that to be a man one must bend nature to one's will or other men. This means ecological catastrophe in the first instance and war in the second. To be a woman, one must be first and foremost a mother and after that a server of men. This means overpopulation and the perpetuation of the two first disasters. The roles are deadly. The myths that serve them are fatal. Women cannot write using all myths, but using new ones. Notes. One. Number three is a version of the winter's tale. Number four, the li number four, the life of Dylan, Th Dylan Thomas, a popularly believed, uh, as popularly believed. Number five, the story of Faust and Margaret. Number eight, a lightly modified version of the Day of the Locust. The others need no explanation. 2. I am indebted to Linda Finlay in the Philosophy Department of Aitutaka College for this information and the short discussion that follows it. 3. I am indebted to Mary Ojo for the observation that Dickens' women are accurately portrayed as long as they are in public, where Dickens himself had many opportunities to observe real women, but entirely unconvincing when they are alone or with other women only. 4. An overstatement. The plot of widowers' houses was a gift. 5. Mary Elman thinking about women. 6. Kate, Mill Kate Millett, sexual politics. 7. In comparison with the organic integrity of Dickens, I suppose. 8. In conversation and in a paper and published as of this writing.